Part one, tonight's session, is called Seeing the Whole Picture. This is going to look at the facts that need to be taken into account when we start to develop a learner profile. Then part two, Understanding Neurodiversity, is going to be delivered next Thursday, the 26th of January, at the same time. aims to enhance our learner profiling by introducing a checklist. And this will provide a framework to inform our observation of our learners' behaviours and their needs. Part three, Classroom Support Strategies, is delivered on three consecutive nights running from Tuesday the 30th of January through to Thursday the 1st of February. This session looks at a whole range of support strategies that you can easily introduce into any learning situation to improve accessibility for all your learners. Now, the overall aim of the training is to help equip the workforce in schools and post-16 educational establishments to deliver effective, evidence-based SEN support for pupils with dyslexia and other specific learning difficulties. Our principal aim in these sessions is, as the title says, to train the trainer. We are going to provide you, our delegates tonight, with materials that you can take away and cascade to colleagues in your own places of work. Throughout the three sessions, we're going to be presenting the materials and also talking through ideas for cascading. When you go on to deliver the materials, the intended outcome is for everyone within your teaching environment to develop their confidence in identifying and supporting the needs of all their learners, including the learners who have specific educational needs. Really, what we're doing is reinforcing the notion from the SEND Code of Practice that all teachers are teachers of SEND. And with your help, we're aiming to give your colleagues an increased confidence to see themselves in this way. Tonight's session forms the first part of the training, seeing the whole picture. And because the key points of this session are the same for all educational levels, We've combined primary, secondary and post-16 slides into our PowerPoint for tonight. So the slides that we're showing are going to differ slightly from those that you have in your delegate packs. So don't worry about this, it's entirely intentional. All of the materials for cascading the training are available on the websites of the project partners. So you can find them on the British Dyslexia Association website, Dyslexia Action, Dyspraxia Foundation, Helen R. Kell, and Patos. You should already have accessed and downloaded the materials before joining this webinar. We hope you have. But if you haven't already done it, we'd recommend that you do so now by following the link on the slide that you should be able to see on your screens. The delegate pack materials include the PowerPoint slides that we're asking you to cascade, and those contain full notes for your presenters. However, I really want to say at this point that the slides and the notes are not written in stone. It would have been entirely impossible for us to develop training materials that were right for every single situation, particularly when we've got such a diverse group of attendees. We fully appreciate the wide range of teaching environments that you're all working in, and also the equally wide range of knowledge that your colleagues will already have of SEND. So we'd encourage you to take the slides away and alter them as you see fit to suit your own specific context. You'll see that the materials include a short guide to SPLD. Now this booklet aims to give a brief overview of the main specific learning difficulties for you and your colleagues. So if you can, please ensure that it's made available in your place of work. If your colleagues have an opportunity to access the guide before for you cascaded training, it will mean that they're able to bring a much greater understanding of the issues to the training situation and of course that means that they'll get much more from it. The materials have been developed by a consortium of leading charities, by all of the project partners that have already listed, but with additional input from Steve Chin, who many of you will have heard of as a leading expert in dyscalculia. Fintan O'Regan, who's advised us on, on ADHD, people from the charity ICANN, who have given information about specific 
uh, language impairment, and also uh, members of Ambitious About Autism. Before we begin tonight's webinar, I'd also like to draw your attention to the questions facility on your screen. Some of you have already been using that. We'll be answering questions at the end of the webinar, so if you can type in any queries that you have as we go along, we'll try to get through as many as possible when we get to the end of the session. We do, though, have 600 or so people registered to attend tonight, and I can see that we've already got 350 online. So if your question isn't answered, we'll also be providing you with email addresses, my own email address and Jenny, our presenter's email address, so that you can contact us directly. So I think that's enough from me by way of an introduction. I'm now absolutely delighted to be able to introduce Jenny Price from Patos, who is going to deliver tonight's webinar. Jenny, over to you. Thank you, Liz. That's a very nice welcome. And I'm delighted to be sharing the presentation materials with you. The face-to-face -face training that we've done has been very well received across the country. And now it's fantastic that you can participate too in the comfort of your own home. My personal interest stems from my role as a member of PATOS. And I'm also a director of the Child and Educational Psychology Practice based in Norfolk. And this is a group of educational psychologists, speech and language therapists, and specialist teachers with a range of expertise in dyslexia, dyscalculia, ASD, ADHD, EAL, and emotional and mental health issues. So we have a wide range of experience that we're combining in our thinking. The training. It's designed to build capacity in our settings, and the rationale behind it really stems from the independent report written by Sir Jim Rhodes, who gave some key recommendations. Most importantly, I think, was his contention that building knowledge and skills of all those adults supporting learners with SEM was paramount. His suggestion was that training should be seen at three levels. Core skills, basic awareness of SEM, appropriate for every member of staff. Advanced skills with more enhanced abilities around adaptation of teaching to meet a particular type of SEM. And those with specialist skills who require in-depth training about a particular type of SEM. Whatever your starting point or your role, this presentation is, as Liz has said, very adaptable. But please remember, what we're sharing with you tonight is training at the level of core skill. You will need to enhance if you want to present this in a, to a different audience, because this is designed for all members of staff. The training can contribute to your school SEN report, and undertaking this training can also be flagged within your local offer. I feel that colleagues could well be encouraged to identify from the training where they have specific gaps in their knowledge and use this to inform their future training needs and CPD. There are excellent suggestions for further training courses in the accompanying guide to SPELD, which Liz mentioned. And again, this is a resource you can download from the website. We want our teams to be outstanding, with teachers and support staff making a significant contribution in their setting. All schools should have a clear approach to identifying and responding to SEM. The benefits of early identification are widely recognized. Identifying need at the earliest point and then making effective provision improves the long-term outcomes for the child or young person. The quote really sets the scene. It clarifies the reason you are delivering this inset or if you're watching the webinar to gather information for yourself, it adds to your thinking and your CPD. The quote allows for discussion and it's an opportunity to share viewpoints 
and gauge the level of confidence in the broader key issues of meeting learner needs. As a starting point, you could ask an open-ended question such as, what are the guiding principles and values regarding SEM in our setting? That could lead to some rich and deep thinking from your colleagues. If you are leading an insect session, depending on the context, you may feel that an icebreaker would be exactly what you need. This particular one that we want to share through the training helps to convey some of the difficulties faced by neurodivergent learners. It's not mandatory, you may have a better icebreaker, but we would recommend this one. The accompanying notes explain it in detail, and from a trainer's point of view, the advantages are that it's very quick and there's nothing to prepare. Plus, the topic of neurodiversity is one that's very pertinent and it's great to place your delegates in a position where they're feeling some of the problems that are faced on a daily level by learners with verbal communication difficulties. The activity itself. They get into pairs and one starts as the speaker, one is the listener. The speaker is asked to talk for one minute about a topic that you create. So it could be what they did at the weekend, where they went on holiday, an exciting event, etc. And the listener just listens. After one minute, you ask them to stop and change roles. But this time, the speaker cannot use any words containing the letter E. This leads to very interesting reflection on the level of frustration of both the speaker and the listener. You can imagine that lack of fluency, lost train of thought, the struggle to put your thoughts into words, how you have to minimize your vocabulary. This is often seen in written work for those with weak spelling, isn't it? So there are some parallels that you can bring into this. So the missing E activity is the type of everyday experience for some, albeit a small number, of our SEM learners. But that sense of challenge, that sense of frustration, that sense of annoyance can pervade many other spelled profiles as well. So we would really advocate this particular icebreaker and it does work particularly well if you have a large group of delegates. We come to part one, seeing the whole picture. Now to get the very most out of the training we would suggest to you that covering parts one, two and three could be done in consecutive staff meetings. This gives you an opportunity to ask people to reflect between the sessions. Perhaps you would ask them to do a particular observation or a task before the next part of the training. And then you can begin with an opportunity to discuss the task and review the learning. We've entitled part one, seeing the whole picture, because we want to encourage teachers and support staff to look beyond their initial impression of a learner and to develop a fuller understanding of their needs based on detailed observation. Now this can be achieved by understanding learner profiles and the next step they need to take. This webinar is setting the scene and the framework of slides and information explores the potential of building a thorough learning profile this is where you would introduce the case studies. For each phase, we've provided a case study with background notes and observations. These can be downloaded and your colleagues given copies for discussion. 
our learners are Sebastian as our primary, Hannah for secondary, and Phoenix for post-16. The first question you might like to ask is, does Sebastian, Hannah, Phoenix remind you of anyone? Is there information that's missing from the profile? You might pose the question, how do we get that further useful information about our learners? Now, you may undertake regular classroom walkthroughs as an informal observational opportunity to look at provision in your setting. They can be very time efficient and focused, but do they actually get to the nub of the issue for an SEN learner with complex and perhaps neurodiverse needs. As we progress through the webinars, we will be returning to our case studies to see if we can shine some more light on their behaviours and increase our understanding of their needs. Now please note that if you feel that these particular learner profiles won't work for your teaching situation, that's fine you might prefer to actually create a learner profile of your own to share with colleagues. The important point is that we're beginning our profile with general observations from teachers, support staff, the learner themselves, and their family. Seeing the whole picture. You've probably met this idea before, but we feel it's worth repeating. The iceberg captures the idea that what we see on the surface is underpinned by a greater hidden depth. Taking the example of a learner as an iceberg, the part of their character that we see in the classroom can be masking a whole realm of hidden depths. This is particularly true of those with learning differences. Sometimes their challenges can be so overwhelming that they mask their learning strengths. However, in other cases, learners can conceal their challenges by putting into place a range of compensatory strategies. In this case, the learner may seem on the surface to be doing well, but below the surface, they are actually struggling to keep up. It's our job as teachers and support staff to dig down below the surface and find out as much as we can about each and every one of us. Let's look at some of the most common co-occurring strengths and weaknesses. This slide presents some of the most common strengths associated with learning differences. Many of these strengths don't necessarily shine in an educational context. However, they can be highly valued in a number of professional roles. You might ask the question, where might this pattern of strengths be most valued? Perhaps you're thinking of web, game designs, architecture. We know that Richard Rogers values the ability of employees with dyslexia to visualize in 3D, so architecture. The creative industries are an obvious example, and you will have other suggestions, I'm sure. We do need to acknowledge that the passage to adulthood can be difficult and learners may have to be helped to appreciate their own abilities. Learners may well not be aware that they have strengths and may not have been in a situation where their attributes are identified or valued. This may be because their strengths are overshadowed by the challenges they face. You may want to ask delegates if they can suggest additional strengths that they have observed in their SEM learners. Or you could pick out one of these in more detail and look at the impact of these strengths. So if we take motivation, 
if you know of the work of Bob Burden at, Univer at the University of Exeter, his work on motivation, the MALS, which is myself as a learner scale, is very interesting. The premise of his work is ability alone is not enough. How we think about ourselves matters too. In Bob Burden's research regarding achievement and the role of self-esteem, he writes, countless research studies have shown that whilst undoubtedly a significant factor in contributing to academic success, measured IQ contributes no more than 40% to the final outcome. Most psychologists now agree that when it comes to individual learning, motivation is key. This raises a whole question of well-being and how we support the emotional growth and self-belief of our learners. Are all teachers and support staff confident in this sphere? This list of strengths is far from complete. You can look at the guide to spelled and neurodiversity to see more detail. But I think you'll agree there's considerable scope here to really enrich and dig deep in your opportunities with your teams to do some valuable thinking and talking about your roles and the contribution you can all make. Now, it would be misleading to focus only on strengths. We know that pupils with learning dif differences face many challenges. And it's important to recognize and understand those challenges. These may include the following. And remember, as with the list of strengths, these lists are not exhaustive. In addition, not all neurodivergent learners will face challenges with all of the elements listed. It's also important to note that challenges may result in different behaviours between different individuals. You may want to ask your teams if they can suggest additional challenges that they've observed themselves. And these, again, may be areas that you want to explore in greater depth. So what about the case studies? We've already looked at some initial observations of our case study learners, Hannah, Sebastian, and Phoenix. Let's now look at the strength and or challenges faced by each of them. What is the impact of their strengths and weaknesses in the classroom? How do we currently plan and adapt the curriculum to meet their needs. What are we missing? If you're cascading this to colleagues, then you would be advised to ask them to reread the background notes about their case study. Perhaps get them to work in pairs or small groups to decide exactly what the learning strengths and weaknesses are. What are they identifying and what are they thinking? Here's a reminder, for example, of the key points in Sebastian's profile. His profile includes the difficulty he has with maths around estimation, his inability to remain focused during an activity, turning around, fidgeting, tapping, etc. That movement of his head to and away from a book as he tries to read. We need to be picking up on these things. And sadly, that struggle that Sebastian's mum is having with him for home reading, it's a frustrating and difficult situation for both of them at home. And alongside, we see in Sebastian some absolute strengths, his exceptional care of his siblings. He's friendly and popular with his peer group. Again, the question arises, is there anything missing? Anything else you would add? 
identifying these strengths and challenges is an important step in building a profile of Sebastian. The presentation will consider other information that will help us to add detail to this profile and further our understanding of his needs. We'll be looking at classroom support strategies that will help us to address these weaknesses whilst making the very most of his strengths as well. Here we have Hannah and her particular strengths, if you recall, and difficulties. We were worried about her social isolation, the fact that friendships are not sustained. There was real concern that she didn't understand the concept of friendship. She was confused and unsure. She tires easily. And that worry about her flexible finger joints and her inability to grip, lift and manipulate small objects. Her attitude and her self-belief in her mathematical skills. There were lots of clues within this profile to alert staff to things that they need to be making deeper observations of. But alongside these weaknesses, Hannah's strengths. We know that she's very committed to her pets. Her language skills are good and she has very proficient reading skills. So things to work on there, some real positives for Hannah. The notes page in the handouts give a reminder of these key points and again can form the basis of some really in-depth discussion and reflection. You would want your teams to reflect on anything else they would need to know and how they would seek that information. And then there's Phoenix, isn't there? Her concerns, her worries about why she has to bother with maths at post-16. She hated, it, hated the subject at school and she's finding that she's needing to repeat coursework. So she's not a happy bunny about that. But if she muddles up 12 and 21 and she's colouring your hair, you might be worried about her maths as well. Her working memory appears possibly to be an issue. So there's lots of information that can be gleaned from looking at that profile of Phoenix. And alongside those particular weaknesses, we know that she has great motor skills. She's good at football. She's a extraordinarily energetic and creative. So let's build on those strengths with Phoenix and identify the challenges and offer her the support that she needs. And again, we'll be looking at classroom strategies that will make a difference to Phoenix in her post-16 setting. Most importantly of all are learners that your teams are actually working with and these are the students and children that are causing them day-to-day -day concern. And this activity will support colleagues in developing profiles. I would suggest that you need to plan how much time you put into this activity according to the experience and confidence of your colleagues. And that will depend on the time that you have available as well. But there's a lot of rich thinking here. They could bring one learner and describe the types of behaviours that they are experiencing. And certainly with secondary students, it's always interesting to hear the perspective of different teachers around the one learner. And that's true of primary and post-16 learners too. You could ask them to share their thoughts and experiences. What have you observed in the classroom? What strengths and challenges do these students present? What are they telling us about how they perceive their education and the learning skills that they have? And most importantly, what is the perspective of their parents or their carers? Bringing this all together, together brings us to the framework for a purposeful pupil profile. And our next webinar will build and extend on this idea of the pupil profile. 
So reaching the end of the presentation, you have a chance to think about how you will cascade the information and the resources included in this part, part one of the training. What resources and activities would be useful to you? Can you lift and shift hours, or do you need to re-establish them of your own that would be better place for your setting? And we would like you to think about the tools that you are currently using to build a pupil profile in your own set setting, or for post-16, your students. How is that information collated in your setting? What what do you do? What do you have available? Because I hope that we can answer some of those queries and add value to it in our second webinar next week. Now, we're very happy to take questions and hopefully provide you with some answers as well. And I'd like to bring Liz in at this point. Hello, Liz. Hi there. Hi, I am still here. I've been busy typing away um, to various queries as, as they've been coming up through the, the session. Um, and I've just got one up here from Abigail, who is asking about MAAL scale and where to find resources. Now, I'm not familiar with the MAAL scale, Jenny. I don't know if you are. Yes, I am. It's, it's the work of Bob Burden at Exeter University, and it's a measure of self-belief, self-esteem, and if you Google, you can find information out about it. It's a published resource, and it's widely used uh, for students between, I think, the ages of 8 to 16, but I think it's probably transferable into that post-16 sector as well. Um, so I yes, I mean go for it. Ha have a have a closer look. I don't think it's in the notes, Liz. I think I've gone off um, piece with that. No. Uh, <laughs> yes. well, it's good for you to to mention Bob Burden's work. Um, so the spelling of his surname, if if you're not sure about it, Abigail, uh, is B U R D E N. Bob Burden. So you should be able to find information if you Google his name. That's great, Jenny. So which that, you, um, obviously you can e really Exeter, Exeter University and it's Mals, M A L S. Yes. Myself as a learner scale. Fabulous, thank you. Uh, I've just had a, a, a query up from Lydia asking how we involve children in identifying their strengths and challenges. I mean, obviously, this is something that's really important to do, and one of the the key ways that we would always recommend um, involving any child in their own learning is asking them a question like, "When you last learned something successfully, how did you do it?" What, what did you do? What engaged you in that learning? Um, it might be that they, they learned to ride their bike recently. So what worked for them when they were doing that? Was that something that, that was really physical? Maybe they've learned to, to play a musical instrument. What would you say here, Jenny, to Lydia? How do we involve well, children? Uh, Lydia, in the child and educational psychology practice, um, our team often use graphic facilitation whereby it's a particular technique to draw an ongoing picture for the child. So that visual ele element makes it very accessible. Now, interestingly, it's not just designed to work with young children. It's a very effective model that you can use with any age group, and you can also use with staff teams as well. And it's a particular seven-step process you do need to be trained in graphic facilitation um, pathways, but it's certainly worth exploring if you're looking for something different. Um, having done it, it then forms the basis of review, and yeah, it's excellent. Um, we use it as a professional team for our own um, strategy and forward planning for our, our, our team, and we use it with 
staff groups and we use it with individual children. So I'd highly recommend graphic facilitation. But again, you do need to be trained in the approach really before you can uh, effectively use it. Great, thank you Jenny. I've got a query here from Philip um, who works in an independent special school for learners who are primarily on the autistic spectrum. He says all students have a statement um, or uh, an educational health and care plan and with only 60 students in the school, he says staff are already very familiar with their students. Would we still recommend the creation of pupil profiles on top of the information that they already have? No, I think, uh, I think if you have that, then time spent with staff might well be better spent in a different way. If you're happy with the pupil profiles. Mm. Yeah. Although, um, again, it's, it's a case of uh, whether the pupils themselves and their families have been involved in the, the information that the school already holds. And I would say if, if they haven't, and if you feel that that's something that you could do more of, Philip, then, then do. Because that's fundamental, I think, to, to getting a, a better understanding of the pupils. Though I'm sure that is something that, that you will be doing with such a small group of pupils. Um, Joel. Oh, sorry. Yeah? I was just going to add no, that. Sorry. I think that's a very, very good point, Liz. The, the other issue is the newly appointed staff coming into the school and an opportunity for them to understand the process and how they can contribute. Um, so you might wish to think about that in terms of an induction for, for new, new members of staff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joel is asking about how the way that strengths and challenges change throughout a, a learner's life. How often should profiles be updated, he asks, and who should do it? <laughs> um, I think that's a really interesting question. And we know how pushed for time you are in schools and therefore you don't want to continually um, have a fixed termly commitment if it's unnecessary. I mean, a minimum, I would say, of once a year. Um, but for some students, it's appropriate to do it more frequently. And that's about the graduated approach to their SEN, isn't it? in terms of assess, plan, do, review. And therefore, that forms the basis of productive and purposeful pupil profiling. So it could well be a more frequent cycle than an annual review, which we traditionally sort of associate with the EHCP students. Absolutely. I've got Julie asking uh, more about graphic info pathways, Jenny. Uh, she says, is there any further information? Perhaps we, we could email that, Liz, or we can come back at the second session with some further information about that. Okay, Julie. We're going to be um, flashing up on the screen in our next slide a couple of email addresses, so uh, you could contact Jenny directly for information about that, if that's okay. Um, I've had various emails coming through from people asking about materials and whether or not they're going to be available after the session. The webinar tonight is being recorded and the recording will be available on the BDA website but also on the websites of all of our project partners so you'll be able to get the recordings on the Dyslexia Action website, PATOS, Helen Arkell and Dyspraxia Foundation. Also as we've already mentioned all of the materials that we're discussing tonight will be available on those, well are available on those websites. I'm sorry I've got a, quite a lot of queries coming through, so I'm just trying to get through as many as I can. I've got one from Angie here. She says, social model approaches combined with inclusive practice is becoming increasingly popular at HE level due to the, um, the student um, grant changes. How would you train academic staff who say they just need to know the student's label, their specific learning? difference or difficulty label. I would say, Angelina, that hopefully 
one of the, the main aims of this training is to get beyond that. So the three stages of the, the, the training, and, and particularly I would say the second part that we're delivering next week, is very much aimed at that, trying to break down this feeling that, that you can encapsulate some, a, a description of a learner through a label. We all know that if you say that somebody is dyslexic or dyspraxic, it is by no means the, all that you can say about that learner or even accurate. No two dyslexic learners, no two dyspraxic learners, no two autistic learners are ever going to be the same. So that would be the first thing that I would say to anybody who says, I just need to know the label. We need to understand how different features of specific learning differences can occur in all of our learners and how the spectrum of neurodiversity affects everybody. So those are the really fundamental things that I would say we're trying to get across in this, this training. Jenny, I'm sure you've, you've got plenty that you'd like to say there too. Well, I, th I think you've covered it, Liz, actually. It is absolutely essential that we help and support our colleagues to have a different lens and see this uh, co-occurrence of specific difficulties that many of our learners will bring into their into the classroom setting and I guess if they're asking for labels they're also possibly wanting strategies and support in meeting those learners needs and I hope that the third session would address that having perhaps cracked the label issue in the second session but good luck with that <laughs> I've got uh, an interesting question here um, from Esther, who says, for training purposes, is there a good dyslexia simulation activity you recommend? And I bet you've got loads of them, Jenny. <laughs> oh gosh, that's, that's putting me on the spot, isn't it? Um, yes, yes, yeah, loads of them. <laughs> it's, it's always good to, to do a, a written exercise just to, to give people um, an indication of how tough our dyslexic learners can find it to copy down. And there, to, to copy down information and there are lots of different things you can do. I, I use one myself where I put up some, no I don't actually give them something to copy, I ask them to write something about what they did at the weekend but they are asked to replace B's with D's and P's with Q's and once they've done that you make it even tougher by asking them to start writing with their non-regular hand and gradually the, the task gets more and more difficult for them and they can see how the language that they put in suffers as well. So it's, it's a, a really good task for showing how um, people are unable to express themselves very well when they have these, these kind of, of issues going on in their inability to, um, to form letters carefully or to control their writing. Anyway, Jenny, that's given you a chance to think. What would you recommend? Oh, well, I was just thinking, well, that's a really good one, Liz. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if, if you bear with us, I can certainly send you, if you email, I can send you out some ideas around looking at reading and the whole issue around print and how you can present some quite effective models to try to shed light on the complexity of the reading process. So I've got some quite fun activities around that. So when we show you our email addresses, which are there, then feel free to email and just ask for some reading activities or whatever and I'll do my best to put a pack together for you. Great, thanks Jenny. I'm hoping that everybody can actually see each other's um, comments to, to questions because we have you know different people sending out different uh, ideas. Maxine um, has been very active uh, and saying that it's a useful exercise to get people to copy Russian. That's that's true, Maxine. I haven't done Russian, but I remember in in one session being asked to try to uh, to copy Arabic script, and that was just so difficult. And the fact that we were going in a different direction as well made it even more challenging. I've got a query here from Abu Bakr, 
who says, how do you help a learner with English as a second language? And of course, that's uh, you know, an e even more complex ballgame. What I would say, though, Abu Bakr, is that many of the techniques that uh, people use in the world of EFL are equally useful for dyslexic learners. So I would say that um, keeping lots and lots of very practical activities is crucial for dyslexic learners as well as people who are learning English as a second language. Um, moderating the, the speed that you that you try to, to teach at, keeping your instructions very, very clear, not overloading with too much uh, problematic language or making sentences too long or making instructions too long. I think when you get to the third part of our training, you'll find lots of ideas that are applicable for your, your situation. Jenny, would you like to add anything to that? I think the challenge is the question about whether or not they have SEN in their native language. Mm. And that's where you may need uh, an experienced practitioner who has both EAL skills and knowledge and the SEN skills and knowledge. Because it cannot be assumed that it is just around the EAL or conversely that they have SEN and it does get quite um, muddy in the middle there so you need to you do need to think about it quite carefully there is one local authority that has produced um, and there may be more than one actually some really excellent resources and again if you email I'll dig out the reference and let you have that link which, you know, if anybody else wants to contribute to that um, from their own local authority or London borough, please do, because um, it is increasingly an issue coming up in schools. Jenny, I've got one here that I think is going to be right up your street. Um, it's a question from, from Titania, and she asks, how can we tap into learners' strengths, particularly if we have ed psych assessments, educational psychologist assessments. For example, if a child has superior picture concept but is very weak on block design, or when they have a very slow processing speed but good working memory, what would you say to that? For me, it's about the discussion and the sharing of real quality time and consultative approach that the educational psychologist will have with you so that you can unpick how you in your setting can best meet those those particular needs just having a report and the analysis isn't going to make the difference that you need to practically make in the classroom so use the time with a psychologist to really understand what it is that they could best advise, how they will come back to you to review, and take it from there. I mean, I think the, the value of the educational psychologist is to take that learning journey with your young people and make a difference. So I would be really asking that question about that particular learner and their report. Thanks Jenny. Now there's a, a question that I, I clicked over a moment ago, so I, apologies, I can't remember who sent it. It was about secondary level pupils and pupils who are just perhaps a bit in, disengaged and when you ask them questions to try to develop a profile, they're all whatever, not interested, don't want to go there. How do we engage them? Um, <laughs> well, I, for me, I guess it's always about trying to, to find that one thing that's going to, to make that connection between you and the young person. Um, have you seen the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, the SDQ? Uh, that's an interesting starting point. Look at it before you use it. Not everybody likes it. The advantages are that it's a free resource and it comes in a number of different languages. 
and seeks the opinions and the, feel, the feelings of the learner themselves, their parents and tutors. So it's uh, a question of collaboration and looking at those particular perspectives and unpicking the strengths and difficulties. So it's the SDQ, which stands for Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire and could be worth um, a punt in your ses setting. But do look at it first and, and do a few dummy runs before you use it, because some of the language may be a little emotive um, for your particular setting. So a reserved. <laughs> if people are interested in that, Jenny, can they email you for, for more details? Is that they can, but if they just literally Google SDQ, they will find it. Excellent, thank you. I've got a, a question here from a, a lady, Farida, in Luton, saying that they have a great challenge there um, in uh, getting support for children who show signs of dyslexia. Now, we know that um, the provision in different parts of the country can be very patchy. How and where can they get support for reader asks um, in assessment and referral? It's a very difficult question, Farida, to, to deal with any particular areas. But remember that the dyslexia charities are all here to help. British Dyslexia Association, Dyslexia Action. Um, I think Patos helps as well, doesn't it, Jenny? Um, yes, it has a very um, strong local group in Hertfordshire. My geography is not that good, but I think Luton's in that area, isn't it? hertfordshire -ish. Middle-ish. Nothing, and I'm Scottish. I have a clue where anything is. So <laughs> so I'm really sorry. But and I'm not though, so no hope. <laughs> do look through the the different websites of of our partner organisations, and hopefully you'll find who's closest to you. If if in doubt, uh, give the the British Dyslexia Association helpline a call, and they should be able to to put you in the the, the direction of of whoever's closest to you as well. I think we're getting very close to having to, to finish up tonight. We've still got um, a few questions here. I'll try and squeeze in about another two or three be before we finish. Um, I've got from Chris. He says, it's a very general question about working in a post-16 environment. He works with a variety of students at different abilities. For students who are around 18 to 25, could there be an appropriate way to upscale some of the approaches mentioned this evening. What would you say, Jenny? Yes, and I think if Chris can bear with us and continue through the three presentations, he, he'll get a greater sense of that journey that he can take with his students. Yeah. The next two sessions, Chris, um, are divided. So part two next week, we've got one session which is for primary and secondary level and combined, and the other is for post-16 on its own. Similarly, part three is divided into the three different um, levels, so we've got separate sessions there for each different level. So as Jenny says, you, you should find much more of a specific uh, focus on that level then. Um, Rachel and Bonnie are asking about where we can get the where they can get the SDQ resource, but I think you've already answered that really, Jenny, haven't you? Yeah, just try Googling and if not, drop me an email. Okay. Um, Anna is asking about learner strengths and weaknesses again. And is there a checklist available of the more subtle elements of body language to look out for? Now I'm not aware of anything that exists in that way, Jenny, are you? No, I think it's about the skills of observation. And next week, um, we will be looking at particular ways that capture some of these key indicators. But again, we'll, maybe, Liz, we can think about how we could talk about <laughs> the sort of qualitative information that you bring to that discussion. Um, so that's a good heads up for us, so thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask Rebecca a question now, if I can. Rebecca, 
Are you there? Hello. Hi, Rebecca. Um, not everybody or our, our delegates aren't able to see the questions that other people are, are asking or some of the responses that some of the delegates have sent out. Uh, is this something that we can capture and um, send, be able to send out to people or be able to include within the recording, do you know? Yes, that's fine. So I'll be able to um, sort of copy some of the responses people have made today and I could put that into a document that we can send out to people who would like that. Or just make available even on our, our website, um, on the BDA website and partners' websites as well. Yeah, that's no problem. I could put it on the same pages that um, where we have the links to the recordings. Great. So hopefully everybody will be able to get that. I want to, before we finish um, the question and answer set, section, to make a point that was raised earlier in the evening by Maxine. Maxine wanted to, to say very strongly that she feels that we have to be careful about the way we use different labels and different acronyms. And she feels strongly that to say people with special educational needs is much more empowering than saying SEN learners. So apologies um, if sometimes we've been careless in using particular labels tonight. Certainly no offence has ever been um, intended. Um, personally, I prefer using the term specific learning differences as well and you'll notice that that's something that, that we've used tonight rather than specific learning difficulties which always has that very negative connotation doesn't it and what we are trying to, to get over here is the idea and very strong impression for our colleagues that we're not just talking about people who have difficulties and challenges with people who have a completely different mindset where they're able to bring all kinds of different talents to the table and that's really important for us. Okay, I'm sorry we don't have time for any further questions tonight. Um, we are going to have to close up now. So Jenny, if you wouldn't mind clicking on to our next slide. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm just, there we go. Thank you, Liz, sorry. I'd just like to say thank you to everybody for attending tonight's webinar. We really hope you've enjoyed it. Do remember that it's just the beginning of our journey and it's just our initial introduction to the topic. Part two is really important. It's called Understanding Neurodiversity. It's going to be delivered next Thursday, the 26th of January, at the same time, 7 p.m. GMT. Please be aware that it's being delivered as two separate events. The primary secondary level training is being delivered by Jenny again um, for PATOS and the British Dyslexia Association. The post-16 training is being delivered by our colleagues at Dyslexia Action. Please ensure that you've signed up for the correct level. You can't sign up for both, but remember that you can access any of these webinars as recordings after the event. Part three of the training is going to be delivered again by the Dyslexia Action Team over three consecutive nights starting on the 30th of January going through until the 1st of February. Do be aware that you need to attend all three parts in order to complete the training. And again, as I've said, you can access recordings of all the events after the live events. So once again, many, many thanks for attending tonight's session. Really hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope that you enjoy the remainder of the evening. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>